Good morning, Grace Church. Let's stand to our feet. It's amazing to see you. We're going to start off and just set our hearts right in prayer. The Lord's Prayer, that's what this song is. Father, let your kingdom come and let your will be done. Let's sing this together. Here we go. Father, let your kingdom come. And Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. And Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done On earth as in heaven Right here in my heart Give us this day our daily bread Forgive us, forgive us As we forgive the ones who sin against us Forgive them And lead us not into temptation But deliver
starting in verse 31, actually verse 35, says this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's some good news this morning, isn't it, church?
Don't greet the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. And the work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living home. Who could so great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living when we sing hallelujah hallelujah praise the one who set me free It's grip on me You have broken every day There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Sing it out And hallelujah Praise the one who set me free Hallelujah Death has lost its grip
this morning we worship you in spirit and the truth it is in your name we pray amen amen you may be seated this morning i actually grew up in a church uh and it was more of a you have to do these things otherwise you're not a christian as soon as i could leave home i actually left and i was looking for freedom and that's where i was trying to find my happiness was trying out all the things that i was never allowed to do there's a lot of emptiness there and a lot of empty promises of what that life will bring for you all of these thoughts of evil in this world that i have been seeing play out I, I feared for my kids and I, and I don't want them to feel what I was feeling. And then I met Abby. I met Hannah at Lifetime. I worked there with the kids in the kids department. One of my favorite things that I love about the job is I get to encourage the parents. Each time I always was like, your girls, they're amazing. This is what they did today. And they're just set apart. They're so unique. And that connected us. And then as we got talking, she started to open up and share her heart. And she began to say, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to make, raise my kids in this culture. I told her that, you know, Lifetime is kind of like, it's kind of like a church for people who like to work out. And so I said, do you go to church? Because clearly this is not a church. Do you go to a church? And I'm like, no, do you? And she was like, yeah, you wanna come? And I was like, yes, please, let's go. I know it can be challenging to want to invite people to church, but it's a powerful environment, being with other people that love Jesus. So I turned to her and I said, all right, so we're in the book of Revelation. It's really intense. Buckle up and I'll explain and help you with anything that doesn't make sense. And we all, like in our heart of hearts, we all want justice. And you need to understand that God is a God of justice. God is not going to let evil win. God is going to hold the wicked and rebellious accountable. How could any of us ever follow a God who left evil unchecked? or let wickedness slide. Revelation 15 was on evil. I mean, that was the very thing she was struggling with. The pastor was talking about everything that I had been feeling internally and the evil in this world and how there's actual hope. I was like, all right, Lord, I just gotta, I just gotta take one more step and then trust you to open another door. And I said, Hannah, have you ever accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? She looks back at me and she goes, I don't know. I mean. It, I grew up in a church, it was really religious, but I'm confused. And I was like, oh, you don't need to be confused anymore. We just pray together and Hannah's tears are just dropping like alligator tears, you know, and looks up at me and she goes, now what? Do you have a Bible? Do you, do you have community? Because we would love to be your community. And I personally would love to walk alongside you. And she goes, would you do that for me? And I'm like, would I do that for you? Are you kidding me? I said, that is the call of every believer, not to just help somebody come to Christ, but help somebody grow in Christ. And then ideally have them help others do the same. There was no hesitancy to go to church. I think that I was very much open to it because I had been pretty much searching for something better than what I had. I do think that there's a lot of people like me out there, people who are feeling lonely and lost and don't know what to do. 
As we study the end times, the compassion that's within each of us needs to come to the forefront. It needs to be what drives our conversations. What I wanna do is I wanna get them in front of the Word of God because the Word of God will speak for itself. I'm really digging into the Bible right now and uh, see the Bible so much differently now. And there's so much to learn from what I'm reading. And that's the, the beautiful thing that I'm getting from the Bible right now is, is seeing how great God is and how there's hope. Amen, yeah. So thank you to Abby and to Hannah for doing that video. I mean, it's not an easy thing to have a camera in front of your face, and they were both super articulate. Amen. We celebrate that today. So Abby was in my office, and she was kind of recounting this encounter with, with Hannah, and I'm like, stop. We've got to get that on a video. It's so encouraging. And I, and I, love, I love that video for multiple reasons. Number one, I think it shows us the impact of being like gospel-centered and gospel-focused and conscientious at work. Two, I think it underscores the persuasion of a simple invitation, that people are more ready than you think. Don't assume that it's always gonna be a hard no. I think people are, are willing and ready to say yes. We just have to invite them. Three, I think it promotes the vision of not just introducing people to Jesus Christ, but coming alongside of them, embracing them, ensuring their, their growth into Christ's likeness. And then I think it highlights the fact that you don't have to be afraid of revelation. You don't have to be afraid of whatever the sermon is. Did you hear what Abby said? Just give people under the word, right? The word always works. I know some people are like, oh, revelation. I can't invite anybody. It'll scare them. Think about what Hannah needed to hear. Revelation chapter 15, like, are you kidding me? Like only God could like orchestrate those details like that, amen? Just beautiful, amen. So thank God for, for Abby and for Hannah. Well, we're gonna be in Revelation 21 today and you're gonna be like, ah, you're gonna breathe a sigh of relief so you wanna make your way there, Revelation 21. But you know, I was kind of thinking about this text and kind of how to set it up and think about it today. And I was thinking, you know, when you hear the phrase, and they lived happily ever after. And they lived happily ever after. You can kind of focus or tend to focus on the finality of that statement rather than on the future state of that statement. Meaning, it may feel more like a conclusion to what happened rather than an introduction to what is, is coming. That said, I think the tendency when talking about the new heaven and new earth in Revelation 21 is to see John's final vision of heaven more as an ending, not a fresh beginning. But that is not a good assessment of the text, right? Heaven is not the culmination of life on earth, hard stop. Heaven is the inauguration the coming out party, if you will, of a never ending life in a new heaven and a new earth. And so the biblical vision of the future for us is not about the end of creation, it is about the beginning of a new creation. Like this picture of what life is like in the new heavens and new earth. Eugene Peterson said it this way, I'll put this on the screen. It's a great quote, by the way. He said this, the biblical story began quite logically with a beginning. Now it draws to an end, not quite so logically, but also with a beginning. The sin ruined creation of Genesis is restored and the sacrifice renewed creation of Revelation. The product of these beginning and ending acts of creation are the same. The heavens and the earth in Genesis and a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation. The story that has creation for its first word has creation for its last word. What a beautiful picture for us. Now, unfortunately, I think much, much of our understanding of heaven today is more cartoonish than it is captivating. Reminds me of the Far Side cartoon. You remember that I saw this and thought I'd show you a picture of it. 
the Far Side cartoon with a guy bored out of his mind, floating on a cloud, wishing he had brought a magazine to heaven with him. Well, it, that's funny, but it falls short in like a million different ways. And so clearly the only authoritative source that we have for life after death comes from the Bible, right? And the Bible speaks about the new heaven and the new earth nearly, nearly 500 times. So today I want to show you, I want to show you some things that may surprise you about your new eternal home that is awaiting you one day. So with that said, let's stand together in honor of God's word. And by the way, I want to make sure I do this. I want to welcome everyone in EP, the chapel, Chaska online and Pocatello. And we were praying for Pocatello this morning. I hope that every one of you who are in Pocatello, Idaho, don't feel like this is just like something that you're watching, but I hope you feel like a part of, of this community. Like we want you to feel like, man, you're in and, and we're all in this together. So we want to welcome you today. Amen. We celebrate them today. Amen. So let's read together God's word. John writes, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse three, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I'm making all things new. Also, he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and they're true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this legacy, this heritage, and I will be his God and he will be my son, my sons and daughters. Verse eight, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This is the word of the Lord, and you may be seated. So let me do this. Let me kind of like uh, throw out, I think, a few surprising facts about your new eternal home. Fact number one is this. It will require destruction. Like verse one tells us, before the new heaven and new earth are created, that the first heaven and the first earth have to pass away. Now, don't forget, Jesus already told us about this in the Gospel of Matthew 24, 35. He said, what? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So Jesus actually predicted the world will come to an end. And so here's the million-dollar question. How will it end? Well, in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter kind of spells this out for us. And so there was a group that Peter was addressing here in 2 Peter 3 that was basically scoffing at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Like, yeah, you talked a lot about it, you've been preaching about it, but it feels like on and on and on and on, a lot of talk and, and no substance. So, so he's addressing that. Look in verse 4, he says, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep or died, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of the creation. Like nothing's really changed. You're talking about the second coming. Where's the proof? And then Peter responds and says, you're overlooking, you're deliberately overlooking some truth here, some facts here. Look what he says. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water, by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished, referencing, of course, what? The flood of Noah. Then look in verse seven. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for, so here's how it's going to happen the next go around. The first time the world was destroyed by flood, the second time it will be by what? By fire, by fire, being kept until the day of judgment, and destruction of the ungodly. Now drop down to verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief 
That's why we always have to be ready, anticipating his return. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed, okay? So clearly, God has designed this universe to be temporary. And one day it will ignite into an inferno. And so Peter wisely poses this question, like how now should we live in light of the fact that everything one day is going to be burned up? The answer is verse 11, look what it says. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Read it out loud with me. You ought to live holy and godly lives. Then verse 12, as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So don't miss, like one feature then of your future home is that it will require destruction, a destruction of the first heaven and the first earth. All of that precedes the new heaven and the new earth. The second surprising fact about your eternal home is that it is going to be a a brand new, fresh, fresh design. Again, verse one says, a new heaven and a new earth will be created. And then notice this, I love this. A new city will take center stage. Look at verse two. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down, look at this, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So there will be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. And all of this then is confirmed in verse five. And he who is seated on the throne said, behold, I'm making all things new. Now that word new in the Greek language means new of a a different kind, something that is qualitatively different than, than the first. So it's not just chronologically new. It's qualitatively new. It's a new design. Like it's, it's different from anything that we know. So we're not talking about uh, land improvement. We're not talking about a few tweaks here and there. We're not talking about renovation on earth. That was the millennial kingdom. That's over with. And everything on this earth, the heavens and the earth is gonna be destroyed. But the Bible says that God is going to make something brand new. He's gonna use different materials, different look, different feel, different vibe, different atmosphere. We don't need the sun or the moon, like the glory of God will shine. It'll be incredible. And the heavens and the earth will pass away, but God's gonna create a new heaven and a new earth. Now, obviously we all love new things. Children love new toys and so do adults, whether it's new shoes or a new house or a new bike or a new car or a a new guitar. The problem with new things is that they don't stay new, right? So in a few years, you're gonna have to get a new water heater for your new house or a new roof for the new house. New things get old and they wear out but not the new heavens and the new earth. They will endure forever and be new forever. Isaiah 66, 22 says this, for as the new heavens and the new earth that I shall remain, that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. So the new heaven and the new earth will endure forever, be new forever. Isn't it interesting too that only one city, in spite of all the amazing cities that we know of and maybe even have visited around the world, despite all the cities in the world, there's only one mentioned in the next life. And so in chapters 21 and 22, the headquarters of your eternal home will be a new Jerusalem. And this city will be different than any other city ever because this one rather than being built by human beings on earth actually comes down out of heaven from God it'll be a completely different city and so God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth 
a new physical planet with dimension and substance. And we're gonna look at, because the Bible talks about this next weekend, we're gonna look at like the specs of heaven, the new heaven and new earth, like what it'll look like and be like. There will also be next week, and we'll talk about this, I think some unique features then to our newly resurrected body, some things that our bodies will be able to do. So you wanna make sure that you come next weekend and bring a friend, okay? Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm not 100% certain what to do with the phrase there in verse one. And the sea was no more. So does this mean that there are no oceans in heaven? There are no lakes to fish in. Some, some theologians, pastors, commentators think that there'll be no ocean, oceans in heaven. Uh, others think that maybe the sea being no more was kind of more of a, uh, an end to all the evil and the chaos based on what the sea symbolized in Revelation. So obviously no one knows, but I, I'll just say this to you. It'll be better than anything that you have ever experienced in life. And before you get like all like bummed out and think that heaven is going to be like a desert in New Mexico, remember Revelation 22.1 says, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. So there is water, there is water, probably palm trees. We just don't know exactly what it will be like. But it won't be, listen to me, it won't be less amazing, less beautiful, less inspiring than anything that currently exists on earth. Like nothing about the new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem will be disappointing. Like you'll never, you'll never be let down in heaven and think, man, you know, I sure do miss Lake Minnetonka. You'll never, like, you're never gonna say that, okay? Wow, I sure miss that. Uh, the third surprising fact about your eternal home is that there'll be a new way to relate to God. So look at this, verse two uses covenant language, that the new creation is likened to a bride. Verse three then says, I heard with a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. Notice how many times that word with is utilized. God is with us. We are with him. We will enjoy God and God will enjoy us. Now, how many of you remember the tabernacle in the, the Old Testament? So if you don't, listen, the tabernacle was essentially a portable tent structure that the Israelites kind of hauled with them, around with them in the wilderness. It had an outer court and an inner court. The outer court of the tabernacle was where the priests made sacrifices for the sins of people. And then there was an inner court where the priests would, would light the lamps, put out the show bread and burn the incense, kind of prepping people's hearts for worship. Then there was like an inner inner court, kind of called the Holy of Holies, and only the high priest could enter into that room one day a year on the Day of, of Atonement. Well, I want you to notice here in verse three how powerful this is. Notice with the new heaven and new earth that all the courts, all the restrictions, all the barriers are gone. And here's what this verse means, that God himself is going to tabernacle with us. That word dwell is essentially the word tabernacle. Think John 1, 14. And here's what it says. The dwelling place of God is with people. We will be his people. He will be our God. Faith will give way to sight. Face to face will replace living by faith. And here's the most beautiful thing, I think in this whole text, we'll see him. We will be with him, just like it was before sin corrupted the world in Genesis 3. Talking with God, walking with God, in fellowship with God, in communication with God. And so notice what the Bible does here. The Bible is kind of pulling everything together. What was aimed for in the Garden of Eden, in the tabernacle, in the temple, in the church, will finally be realized in the new heavens and the new earth. God will dwell with his people 
in, a, in an intimate covenant relationship forever. And all of God's people said, like, like amen, amen, right? Game changing. The fourth surprising fact about your eternal home is that the life to come will be infinitely better than the life you're in. Now, my guess is that Revelation 21.4 is probably the most memorized, right, recognized verse maybe in chapter 21, maybe in the whole book of Revelation. And I think the upshot of verse four is that God will remove all the ill effects of sin and will guarantee that sin will never again result in disaster, destruction, or death. So remember, what has happened to death at this juncture in the end times? Death has been tossed into the lake of fire. So Satan is in the lake of fire. Sin has been defeated and destroyed. Death has been cast into the lake of fire. So John is describing via intel from the throne what the new heavens and the new earth is going to look like. So listen to this. Here's a glimpse. He's gonna wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. First, let's look at this here. God will wipe away every tear. There won't be Kleenex in heaven. Isn't that beautiful? And here's why. God will get to the root of every issue. There will be no problems, tragedies, struggles, issues, hurts that will drive you to tears. So think about living in a world. Think about this. Think about living in a world where there's never any bad news. I mean, just think about it. I feel the same way. It makes me cry too. Like, yes. Because all day long, what do we hear? Bad news, bad news, bad news, right? You open up your phone, you get on your laptop, your computer, and it's just like, you're always like, oh my gosh, what else can happen? What other bad news can we absorb? Well, think about living in a world where there'll never be any more bad news. Think about living in a world where there'll never be anything to cry about. It's incredible. So dads, dads, listen. When your sons are being soft and you're trying to get them to man up and you say, hey, I'm gonna give you something to cry about, and that, that won't work anymore. You can't say that ever again. It's not true. Second, there'll be no more death. There'll never be, right? You'll never go to another funeral again. You'll never visit another cemetery. You'll never grieve again. You'll never have to say goodbye to a loved one again. You'll have to hold their hand as they pass from this life to the next. You'll never miss anyone again. And you know why? I'll tell you why. Because you'll never age. You'll never age. You see, if there's no death, then there are no conditions that bring death. No sin, no aging, no disease, no hospitals, no doctors. You'll have a perfect body. And some of you are going, I already have a perfect body, Troy. I've been working really hard on this bad boy. Well, let me just simply say this to you. Gravity and entropy and time are not on your side. They are not your friends, okay? And they will be fighting against you. And then in a matter of time, they will win. They will win the battle. But you will have an ageless and perfect body in heaven. And we talked about this. Not a perfect body in the sense of like the measurements and the shapes are a-okay, not that. But you'll have a body that won't fight against you anymore. You'll have a body that won't wear out on you anymore. So when I turned about 50, I remember thinking, why do I always have an issue with my body? Why is something always tweaked, hurting, torqued, or in pain? So one day it's like my calf, something's wrong with my calf, so I do an exercise to get my calf right. And then I got a hamstring issue. And then it's like the right side of my low back and Man, it's like my body, my body is like warring against me. So I have good intentions, but my body does not, right? And the Bible says that one day you're gonna have a perfect body that won't fight 
against you anymore. So think about this. There will be no knee and hip replacements, no heart transplants, no sickness, no disease, no cancer, no disabilities, no blindness, no deafness, no need for glasses or hearing aids or contacts. The lame will walk, the blind will see, and the deaf will hear. There will be perfection, right? Perfection. Third, there will be no more pain. No more physical pain, mental pain, emotional pain, ever. And some of you, like some of you live in constant pain. Like you're walking around in constant pain. That's why you can relate to David and what he said in Psalm 6.6. 6, I'm weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. Listen, you need to understand that one day in heaven, you're never gonna hear this phrase, have a good day. Why is that? Because every day is gonna be a good day. There's no such thing as a bad day. There will be no sorrow, no regret, no hurt, no tragedy, no discouragement, no disappointment, no depression, no anxiety, no right, addiction, no exhaustion, no pain. It'll be, I'm gonna put this on the screen, and here's why all this will be true. Because it'll be a life without the presence of sin, without the pull of sin without the power of sin, without the penalty of sin. It'll be a life without the accusations and temptations and, and deceitfulness of Satan, right? Trying to bring you down and to accuse you. It'll be a life without the enemy of death stalking you and your family. Why? Satan has been cast into the lake of fire. Sin has been defeated by Jesus Christ forever. Death has been cast into the lake of fire and this is the new life that awaits you. It's incredible, isn't it? It's incredible, amen, amen. Now the fifth surprising fact about your eternal home is that not everyone, not everyone will be there. You see it in verse eight. So the new heaven, understand this, the new heaven and earth is the eternal home of people who've trusted in, believed upon, Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. But unbelievers will spend eternity in the lake of fire that burns with fire and sulfur. So notice in verse eight here in Revelation 21 that unbelievers are identified in this verse as the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars. Now, if I'm honest with you, the one word that kind of really jumped off the page at me and kind of surprised me a little bit was that word cowardly, that word cowardly. So it's referencing cowardly unbelievers who reject Jesus Christ because of fear, fear of, of losing their possessions or fear of losing their jobs or fear of losing their friends or their reputations or their status or their comfortability in life if they trust in Jesus Christ as the Savior. So think of it like this. Cowardice keeps people out of the kingdom. We're so worried about what everyone else may do, think, or say. We're, we're afraid of, of their response. Top of the list, cowardly, cowardly. Other sinners are identified as those who murder, those who cater to sexual lust, those who lack moral character, those who deal in illegal drugs, worship false gods, and, and lie. All of, these, all of these characters experience the second death or eternal suffering in the lake of fire. And so tragically, their refusal to trust in Jesus Christ imprisoned them in their sins and then led them ultimately to be cast into the lake of fire. But he says this, verse seven, the one who conquers will have this legacy, will have this heritage. Here it is. I will be his God and he will be my son. We'll become sons and daughters of God. So overcomers, conquerors inherit the new heaven and the new earth, and we are adopted by God as his children, as his sons and as his daughters. We are a part of the family. But here's the question. How, how do you conquer? Like, how do you overcome? Do you just try super hard? I'm going to grind it out. I'm going to overcome. No, not at all. You overcome by, by faith. 
1 John 5, 4 and 5 tells us, right? For everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. What does it say? Our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? It is our faith in Jesus Christ alone that makes us overcomers. Then listen to this incredible summary statement. Verse six, and he said to me, it's done. Think about that. Reminiscent of John, it's finished. It's done. What's done? Satan's done. Sin's done. Death is done. The first heaven and the first earth passed away. It's done. And now all things are being made new. And then he talks about who he is. I am the alpha and the omega. I'm the beginning and the end. And I am everything in between. And then he lays out hope, right? To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. So Jesus always, here's what you need to know. Jesus always finishes what he begins. And then he says this, for those who thirst for spiritual satisfaction, Jesus gives it without charge. It's free. It's a free gift. And his free gift of grace saves us and satisfies us forever and ever. Amen. That is your future if you are in Christ Jesus. So here's what I want to do today. We did this the first service and had a lot of people respond. A lot of people say yes. I'm going to lead you then through a guided prayer. And I want to encourage you because some of you are like battling with the, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the fallout of trusting in Christ. What will my wife say? What will my family say? How will my friends respond? I want to encourage you. That cowardice can keep you out of the kingdom. So we want to lay aside all of our fears and we want to place faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to lead you then in a guided prayer. So if you bow your heads with me, and I'm going to ask you to do something just a little different. As you bow your heads, I'm going to lead you in a guided prayer. At the end of the prayer, I'm going to ask you if you have trusted in Jesus Christ for the first time, I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up and let me know. And if you slide your hand up and let me know, I'm going to encourage you to come and talk to me Make your way to our prayer resource center. So at all of our sites, right, in the chapel, Chaska, those of you watching online, you gotta let us know. Pocatello, you gotta let the people there know, right, that, that wanna come alongside you, the counselors, right? I know Jake is leading a team of folks out there. Eric and Kimberly Jackson as well, they're in Pocatello. You gotta let that community of faith know that, man, you said yes to Jesus, okay? So let's, let's bow our heads and let's pray. And you just pray with me. If you've never trusted Christ, God, I know, I know that I'm a sinner and I am in desperate need of a savior. And I'm gonna ask right here and right now that you would forgive me of all of my sins, past, present, and future. That you would come into my life and fill my life, save me through your work on the cross. I, I trust you right now. Lord, forgive me for worrying so much about what everyone may say or think. For being afraid and fearful and cowardly. I turn from that fear and by faith I say yes to Jesus right here, right now. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you've made it clear for me through your word. Thank you that your grace saves and satisfies. Thank you for writing my name in the Lamb's book of life. I believe your word's true. So if that's you today and you've prayed that prayer for the first time, you don't have to look around. If you just slip your hand up, just kind of let me know. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Just slip your hand up. It's beautiful. 
so listen, if you would do me this favor as we pray, you gotta let us know. We wanna come alongside of you. This is like the first step in this journey called the Christian life. So you gotta let us know. Come let me know. Come let our prayer resource team know. We wanna walk alongside you and help you in this journey of following the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. So God, we thank you. We thank you that you're making all things new, that you are the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. And to the thirsty, you give from the spring of the water of life without payment. We thank you that you always finish what you begin. And we thank you that your grace saves us and satisfies us forever. Thank you for, for speaking to those here today, Lord, to trust in you for that very first time. And I pray you give them the courage then to follow Jesus in a culture that opposes them and a culture that doesn't understand what this gift is actually all about. Give them that courage and, and bravery today, that heart today to trust Jesus above all else. So Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's trustworthy and that it's true. There's no other book like this book and there's no other savior like Jesus. A lot of religions, but one gospel. And Lord, we thank you that this gospel is a free gift. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. You receive this teaching today. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace. And oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom He faithfully bore He canceled my debt And he called me his friend When death was arrested in my Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. Here we go. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hell. And that's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, yes. Oh, your grace so free washes over.
Life begins with Jesus, and so many today have experienced new life in Christ. Are you glad about that? Oh, amen. Amen. And if you have raised your hand today, you prayed in your heart, however you did it today, it's time to go public with it. And many, I mean, we've got close to 100 people right now registered for August 5th, Waves of Grace, people going public with their faith in baptism. If you pray to receive Christ today, go public with it on August 4th. Well, you can start and go public with it today. But August 4th, you can get baptized, 5 p.m., Waves of Grace. If that is you today, go to the Connect page and register. We will help you with that act of obedience and that public declaration. August 4th, 5 p.m., right here in the auditorium. Go to the Connect page, click the link, and register. If you've come prepared to give like so many do every Sunday, thank you. The giving stations are at all the entrances and exits. You can also give at grace.church slash give, and you can give within the Grace Church app. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for freedom that is found in you, that we can say, indeed, we are free from the chains of death, being slaves to sin. Jesus, you are a master. Help us as we leave this place today to represent you well in everything that we say and do in the way we think and the way that we live our lives. Jesus, may it be a reflection of your goodness in us. We pray it in your powerful name. And everybody said, amen. See you later.